Again, self-publishing episode number 105, the latest on the Kindle store with Alex Newton. Interested in self-publishing but don't know where to start? Want to get your book onto Amazon? Want to hold your paperback book in your hands? Learn how on the Begin Self-Publishing podcast with your host, Tim Lewis. Long-time listeners to the show may have already listened to the previous two episodes I've done with Alex Newton, where each time we have an update on what is hot and what is not on the Kindle store. He works for a company called Kalytics, who basically have a little program that goes through looking at the Kindle store, working out what the most competitive and least competitive sections are, and what the highest selling and lowest selling parts of the Kindle ebook store. So I thought it'd be interesting to get him on again because it's been about nine months since the last time we did a show. So now over to the interview. Hello, Alex. Welcome to the show. Well, hello, Tim. Great to be back here. Hello, everybody. So since the last time you were on the show, what is the biggest new trend in the Amazon eBooks marketplace? Well, I think there are a couple, actually, both on the reader side and on the Amazon side and on the author side. If we start on the author side, well, I think the biggest new trend is the authors aren't getting tired. They still write books and plenty of them. So since we last talked, I just looked at the numbers again. We we now have about 4.2 million English-speaking Kindle books right now. Just last 90 days was another 216,000. So on an annualized basis, we, we are seeing a supply growth of books of about 20% a year. And that, to me, if I look at the early numbers, it was always like, you know, double digit. And in the big high times, it was even up to 25 at times 30%. Now, on an annualized basis, it dropped a little bit below 20. Now we're back to 20. So people are still going into the self-publishing business and or in the publishing business for that matter. So one trend is still big growth on the supply side. I think on the reader side, the story is basically the, the mainstream media, to use that term, in that case, the mainstream publishers and their, say, research organizations still want to make you believe big revival of print ebooks dropping. I think just the other day there was an article in The Guardian in the UK that the UK ebook market allegedly dropped by 17%. And I frankly don't believe those numbers. I don't believe them for a number of reasons. The panels they use are primarily consisting of traditional publishers and they do not have Amazon in the sample. And if you look to also other sites such as author earnings, their latest numbers suggest that in fact the ebooks have grown yet again. And there was a, a bit of a resurgence of big publishers in ebooks like last October. Also that faded away and indie publishers are still gaining share and especially small publishing companies in the ebook world. So I don't believe that the demand growth is as high as the supply growth, but it's growing. And I think that's very good news. Well, while we're at it, if we look at trends on the Amazon side of things, on the Kindle platform, there's two bigger changes since we last talked, and they just happened pretty recently. The one is Amazon did two things. One is they have been opening up there, and that may be a bit technical now, but they have been opening up their category system. What does this mean? Traditionally, you could also only have like two or three categories in which you could put your book, and they now open this up. So you can you can basically write an email to KDP support and say, I'd like to have my book. It fits into this, 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 and this categories, up to 10 categories, right? So in the product details, it will still only show like two or three, and it will show those categories where your book ranks in, but it will also be visible in in all the other category and could go into a long debate about that, whether that's good or bad for writers, because you see also smaller smaller categories being hijacked by very successful books, you know, whether it's Harry Potter or gender games and these sort of things. So that happened. And I think one other trend is they Amazon actually took away some of the visibility they've given you on the 
categories. What do I mean with that? When you go onto the Amazon platform, like right now, and you type in on the Kindle platform, whatever science fiction bestsellers or novels, any search word, a couple of weeks ago, when you clicked return, Amazon would show you books as a search result. But on the left hand sidebar, they would show you where do the search results come from and how many per category. So they, if you typed in whatever ever romance novels, you know, it would show here 300,000 titles found in the category romance, but another 40,000 in the category literature and fiction slash women's fiction and so on. So there was a big, big visibility on the size of categories, like on first sight and, and where your search results come from. And for authors and publishers, that has been very valuable. Now, Amazon took that away. So you literally have to click on each and every result on the sidebar to still get to that number. There's a little trick. And we at Kalytics still got you covered because we do that for authors. So we still have complete visibility of the category sizes. But it seems Amazon wanted to, I don't know why they did it, perhaps for user interface issues, because the left sidebar looked cluttered with all those numbers. I think many authors noticed that they don't have the visibility they used to have. So has there been any genre that has markedly increased in sales success recently? Well, there are a couple. I mean, we, we do measure these genres like on a 12-month and 18-month basis. And if I look at, you know, what has seen like a remarkable change either up or down, then on the top of the list, the ones that, that have grown by almost improved their sales rank very significantly, we have Things, for example, like literature and fiction, mythology, folktales, and folklore. And you go into this category and say, well, well are people now reading folktales, right? Well, you then look further and say there's another category that's like really, really growing, and it's a literature and fiction, genre fiction, metaphysical. And when you go into these categories, what we noticed, these books are primarily urban fiction type of books like supernatural mystery these types of things and i think good news for urban fantasy authors because after i think the big peak of the genre was like three years ago and we are clearly seeing here a, a resurgence resurgence of that one another one that has been growing quite dramatically is a number of teen and young adult categories such as romantic mystery and thriller and that has been primarily driven by Bella Forrest and lookalikes who, after their her hugely successful Shade of Vampire series, which like completely dominated these bestseller lists in teen and young adult fiction, she now successfully launched this new series around this gender game series where I think she, first of all, she really struck a chord with this whole whatever probably gender discussion that's been going on in the mainstream media for the past couple of years. Then the other thing is she has a reader base and she's really leveraging that reader base into this new series, right? And to the British, also the, the category literature and fiction British, I haven't looked at what's really in it driving it, but that's been growing quite a bit. And also short stories have seen a bit of a revival, not short reads, so not necessarily less than 100 pages, but short stories. Okay. So last time we talked a lot about nonfiction. In terms of fiction, which categories are the best to write in from a market perspective, i.e. not much supply, but a lot of demand? Well, the sequence, the ranking on Amazon is very clear on a, on a high level romance is the uncontested number one genre on kindle and the main reason for that is also the kindle owner demographics and because many of the kindle owners are women say age 30 35 and up so that is a prime driver it's followed by mystery thriller suspense and it's followed by science fiction and fantasy now within those we obviously have many many subgenres. And if we go on to a subgenre level, we see that, for example, in romance, you have things like military romance, still sky high demand. You have things like now in summer, 
and with the upcoming football season, sports romance is doing extremely well. So it's these types of things that are going well. In mystery, thriller and suspense, if we had a look into that one, we just actually launched our our last mystery, thriller and suspense a special report. Now, within that one, one has to also be always aware of, well, what is really behind the growth of certain categories, because there can also be false positives. There's a very prominent example where you think, oh, my God, you know, this mystery thriller suspense genre is growing again. But then you go in it and it's again romance behind it. So one very interesting example was in mystery thriller suspense, you have a subcategory crime fiction. And within that, you have organized crime, right? And we've seen like a 50%, 54% improvement in sales rank of that genre. And so I went in and had a very close look and what are really the books behind this. And guess what? There is a romance subgenre, which is basically called like bad boy romance or MC motorcycle club romance. So these romance novels often involve gangs or, you know, bad boys, mafia guys, you name it. And it seems that all these bad boy romance authors started putting their books into mystery, thrillers, suspense, crime fiction, organized crime, because organized crime is a big part of the, I wouldn't say the romance plot, but the side plot of that romance novel. So that's a bit what's happening there. On the last time we talked about the flooring tiling category, which was a category that you could put basically you could sell one book and you would get to the top of the charts in. Is that still the most ridiculously easy category to chart in on the Kindle store? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually looking here right now in our members database as we speak. And yes, the floor tiling is still there, but it's it's highly contested by other extremely attractive Kindle categories. So I see here a whole number of categories where the average sales rank of the top 20 titles in the category is less than like 700,000, worse than a million. So the very worst one right now, if you want to have a number one bestseller with like selling less than a copy in, in two weeks or something, would be reference book, Atlases and Maps, The World. You could also do a law, a practical law guide on living wills, which would get you into the number <laughs> one. There are a couple of funny ones out there. Ah, this one. If you are an expert in historical military uniforms, there is a whole Amazon category for that. And yeah, I think you only have to hit sales rank 2,071,000 on average. The number one bestseller of the category has a sales rank of 800,000. So that's something you should be able to beat. And if you have a kid and you are into crafts, hobbies and homes and crafts, hobbies, ribbons, into how to make ribbons, here you can be a number one bestseller tomorrow. Yes. So is that the very easiest category or is it, or is it still floor tiling? So floor tiling right now, if I look at it, is like the 25th easiest one out of 3,000, roughly. And he says the bonsai tree category was uh, was always uh, popular for bestsellers as well. Absolutely. Now, you're laughing at it, but I think one topic we also could very briefly talk about is the whole, you know, scamming thing. And there, yeah. there's like two things happening. The one thing is, I mean, obviously we have here the data, but we do not promote, you know, abusing the system, right? But what you do see people do is they identify these categories that are ridiculously easy to rank in. Now, I have no problem with people putting a book that, you know, vaguely fits the category, yeah. put it in the category. Yeah? I mean, fair enough. That's tactics and there can always be a debate. But... I think where a line is crossed is, for example, the other day there uh, I saw there are 233 children's book related categories on Kindle. Amazon is putting a a huge emphasis on on kids again right now. They just updated, gave a facelift to the Kindle Fire device for kids and it comes with content, right? And they have parental controls on those devices so the parents can basically configure what type of content people get 
Now, where I saw a line crossed is the other day, there is a kid's book category, which is like Westerns, right? So whatever, the nine-year-old boy has this device and he's browsing whatever Amazon and wants to have buy a book about cowboys, right? And what do you see there? You all of a sudden see all sorts of mail order bride type of Western romance novels in there because it's so easy to rank in kids' books, in these types of kids' books category. And I think that's really where a line is crossed. Yeah, I mean, it should at least have some kind of resemblance to the category. I mean, even if you cut and pasted a load of blog articles about bonsai trees, that's going to be way better than putting your romance book that happens to be set in a bonsai garden in the bonsai tree <laughs> category. Exactly. And the other thing, you, you know, people who do this type of thing, I mean, there is a reason why you do it, because the reason why you do it is if you say there was one example, say a paleo cookbook or a glycemic diet, whatever it was. So it was a specific diet book that had all sorts of keywords related to that type of diet in the book title. So you could see it was like a real, you know, search engine optimized type of book. I wouldn't comment now on the content, but the SEO part of, of it was really well done. They put this book into my very favorite category is actually not bonsai or the floor tilings. My favorite one is rodeos, outdoor sports rodeos. So all of a sudden you find this paleo diet book in rodeos. Now, what does this do? The, is there any benefit for the author? Well, there is because the trick is if now a person puts in a search term on, say, paleo cookbooks, a search word that actually matches this book, Amazon will move results up that are bestsellers in that have that bestseller badge. So I made the test. I clicked the, a part of the title as a search word into the Kindle search bar. And the number one search result was that paleo diet book. And it had the orange bestseller book right next to it. And on that search result page, you don't see where the bestseller badge comes from. Only when the customer clicks on the book and scrolls all the way down to the product information, the customer would actually see, well, it is a number one bestseller, but not in paleo diets, but in outdoor sports rodeos. So there is a bit of a deceit type of thing going on. That's why people do this. Yeah. I mean, the term number one Amazon bestseller has been more abused than I think any other term in the English language in the last couple of years. The fact that somebody's, That's true. somebody's number one for piano tuning in the garden or whatever it is category doesn't make them necessarily a world authority on self-publishing. But And especially it won't make people be able to pay their bills, which is the other big thing. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about a bit about fiction. What is your best tip for somebody who is looking for a category to write a non-fiction book in at the moment? Right. Well, first of all, the bigger picture on non-fiction is an interesting one right now because nonfiction has never sold as well as fiction. We know that on Kindle, but it has always been, say, pretty stable and moving like in parallel to fiction. Over the last couple of months, we saw nonfiction as a whole category take a dive is perhaps too strong a word, but it a significant decline over the past like four or five months. And it, it was not the typical seasonal phenomenon that you have, you know, all the people uh, read nonfiction and self-help book when it comes to New Year's resolution and, and before you go into the summer season, it was not the seasonal factor. So there was a bit of a systematic factor that nonfiction as a whole has seen a decline. Now, what is interesting, though, for nonfiction authors is that within nonfiction, we also have all sorts of categories, right? And there are a couple ones that have been growing against the trend. And these ones are the interesting one. So, for example, the category self-help, which is a fairly broad category, has grown again over the last 12 months pretty continuously. And that's good news because the last time we, we did a special analysis of this whole self-help, motivational, self-transformation type of market, it, it was pretty bleak. Right now, it's it's doing pretty well. We're going to do a special on it soon. So all these things like self-help, motivational, self-help, 
personal transformation, self-help, happiness, self-help, self-esteem. These types of categories have seen a very positive development in the last 12 months. We also will have another look at business books and what's in there. And always, if you do nonfiction, my tip would be really do look at the top 100 bestseller list. I think in many other genres, the top 100 bestseller list is not that useful if you want to look at it strategically because you have so many books going in and out. What is interesting on the self-help category, we just made an analysis of the top 100 and compared to what the top 100 looked like six months ago. And guess what? I think it was like 30% of the books that were in the top 100 six months ago are still in there. So that gives you a pretty reliable picture. And you you see things like, you know, evergreen topics such as habits and all these habit type of books, you know, like our friend Steve Scott has been big in, in, in that niche. So have a look at these. That would be my hint to nonfiction authors. The final hint for nonfiction authors do not get into these super, super micro niches. You know, do not go into, as we just discussed, gardening, horticulture, growing bonsai. These types of very small nonfiction niches, they are just not financially viable. It won't work. You, you do have to go for the bigger topics and strike a chord with people there and have a good SEO, have good marketing, and then you have a good chance of also succeeding in nonfiction. I suppose the ideal though is that if you can find one of those small categories that your book actually does apply to and a bigger category, then you could kind of have the best of both worlds in a way. But it's obviously going to be a bit difficult with the bonsai tree example. Exactly. I mean the the tactical placement of the book in categories, I always tell authors that's one thing, that's tactical. But the the meat to the bone, the book itself, yeah. the topic, that has to be popular. And what I mean with that is it cannot be addressed to small, too small a niche, because then if you want to earn money with it, Kindle is just not the right channel. If you have the leading website for, you know, whatever, the, yeah, whatever ribbon making, then or the, the leading YouTube channel and you monetize it, I think that'll work. Kindle often does not work because people are not aware of what the actual demographics are of people who own Kindles or e-reader devices, right? So I just for example, when it comes to kids' book, we just did a special on kids' books, ebooks, and it's it's a very interesting market because it's now being heavily pushed by Amazon. But you have to wait until a certain amount of kids, you know, have a Kindle Fire device because otherwise where should they read the books that you publish on the Kindle platform? Yeah. So you talked about, obviously, the categories which were doing well against the fall in, in nonfiction sales. What categories in nonfiction are falling then much more severely? What, what isn't working in nonfiction that's dragging the whole market? We saw a, quite a decline in, in things like, especially crafts, hobbies and home. My opinion is the reason is probably twofold. It's partly seasonal, right? Because in summer, you don't have many people obviously buying books like How to Cut a Christmas Tree. But it also seems, I mean, a Kindle book is not the first port of call when you have a certain craft hobby or whatever, home appliance thing that you want to solve. You go on YouTube, you go on Pinterest. These are probably in Google search for that matter. But it's not like, oh, now I go on Amazon and I now want to find a Kindle book and then I download it onto my black and white Kindle device and try to decipher a narrative on something. So that's where I just find Kindle is absolutely the the wrong platform to convey the message. And I think after a certain hype, because we had so many authors during the Amazon Kindle gold rush, you know, go into crafts, hobbies and home every, I think every grandma was starting to upload a Kindle book, how to how to make the best strawberry strawberry jam. <laughs> and yeah, that's what happened. And and obviously, if then the sun does a big Facebook promotion on it, perhaps a couple of books were sold, but then they soon noticed, well, that doesn't make sense. And so we, we see probably also the enthusiasm by the authors of these books to market the books and incur the expenses associated with it. We see this fading. Yeah. 
Okay, so on a wider point, what are your predictions for the future of the Kindle store? First of all, I think it's there to stay, right? I mean, Amazon continues to, although not with lightning speed as if they wanted to travel to Mars, but they are still giving facelifts to the Kindle devices, at least the Fire devices. I think there is has been quite some debate on, is it still hip to have a Kindle device, right? Because when they came out 10 years ago, they it was like really hip to have one of these devices. Now they, made, especially the older ones, look clunky and you don't want to be seen with one, right? So I think as long as they do a little bit of technology development, Kindle is there to stay. Just in the Amazon Prime Day, they did a huge promotion on Kindle Unlimited. I think they an annual subscription was discounted from $120 to $90 or even less. So they are promoting it. They are promoting it also to teens, to children, because they just know that people who have a Kindle device, people who have any of their subscriptions, whether it's Prime or Unlimited, just have a higher propensity to buy other stuff on Amazon. So it's a big marketing channel for them. I think it's here to stay. And with the complementary offering of Audible, I think it, it will be there. What I do think they really have to get their arms around is probably two, three things, because the user experience is deteriorating on Kindle. The user experience is deteriorating because they are still treating the Kindle platform as a library of Congress, which is to say shelf space doesn't cost really, right? You can upload your book and whether it's sold or not, it, it's there to stay. Well, that is great. But if you are now as a user, start looking for a book on any kind and well, let's stick with our bonsai tree example and, you know, type in bonsai trees, how to grow and you all of a sudden get 23,000 search results for that because over a course of 10 years, you had so many people publish a book in the category, you're completely lost. So I have the very representative market sample of Survey01, who's my wife. She's owning a Kindle and she just started putting it down because Many of the really good books are not available on the Kindle Unlimited. So I think one has to distinguish between Kindle and Kindle Unlimited. So the device she still likes, but the user experience, I think, is much to be improved. These are all technical things, but they have to work on this whole thing of, well, do I want to have a library of Congress? Because when you want to have a, a book, you go into a little bookstore. If it was a print book, right, on the airport, there is bestsellers. You want to buy something. You don't want to go into the Library of Congress and spend a day researching until you find what you're actually looking for. So that they have to solve. And the other big things, to my mind, is the scams. Because if you Google Amazon Movers and Shakers, which shows all, you know, which works across products, not just Kindle, which shows you all the items that have seen a huge surge in sales rank, if you do it right now, you find like two, three romance titles up there where you just know, you know, I mean, the author is unknown, has only a handful of reviews. And there it is like number five on the Kindle store overall, you know, right next to Harry Potter and Stephen King. And you say, how the heck can that be? And well, if, if you have your PC there, you know, just Google inside a Chinese click farm. There were just a number of interesting videos uploaded and, and shared like thousands and thousands of time by a Russian guy who went and filmed how these click farms look like. And that's a shame. And since Amazon support, they have only X many people. I think they are not staffed up either technology wise or sheer headcount wise to handle the challenge of all these scams going on that harm all the other authors who, who try to make a living a living legitimately. Yeah, I mean, I know that David Goggin's done a post on one particular book where it went from like 2 million in the uh, Amazon category to number one briefly in about yeah. a day. And he was like, well, how can this possibly not be some sort of click from? I saw that post and I think it's an excellent post because it really put some research in it. And if I followed it correctly, he also approached Amazon and really confronted them with the issue and, and was very 
tenacious and persistent in approaching them. So uh, I, I think other authors should support these type of posts, share them with others so that Amazon just cannot close its eyes on it, but that they finally do something about it. Yeah. Anyway, so I think that's just about completed our latest recap of the market. For people who haven't maybe listened to the previous interviews or for people who've forgotten, can you take us through about Alex Newton and Kalytics and all the things you do and where people can find you? Well, of course. So uh, very briefly, my um, I started in the publishing career some 20 years back, worked in publishing, then uh, went, however, out of publishing and worked in, in the corporate consulting world where I basically every day solve problem using data. And about three years ago, we started the company Kalytics, which comes from Kindle Plus Analytics, where we basically monitor on a monthly basis books, categories, etc. We have a database of about 3,000 book categories. So we measure price levels, sales ranks, level of competition, all the things that you need to assess to make a strategic decision as a publisher about your book portfolio or genre portfolio, or as a writer, our my personal mission is to basically help writers who have a passion to write something for a certain topic, for a certain genre, and match that passion with the market side of things. I try to avoid the term right to market because I think there's also, it, it's used in a derogatory way because if you only write for the money, that's also not sustainable but if you match your passion with what's really happening in the market i think you can make a career as an author and we try people help do that if you want to check us out please do so um it's klytics.com k hyphen it's spelled with a hyphen so k hyphen lytics like an analytics.com and um, if you have any questions you can also always reach me by email at support at klytics.com Well, thank you very much for being on the show again, Alex. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please stop by iTunes and rate and leave a review. This helps make the show more visible. For free resources, show notes, and other helpful content, join the community at beginselfpublishing.com. 